Thank you very much, Sergey. So once again, thanks everybody for coming here, both in person and online. So um, yeah, today we're con uh, I continue my uh, sequence of lectures, and what I want to talk about today is I will talk about uh, positive definite kernels, and I will get to the linear programming method and uh, some other applications of positive definite kernels. So we'll, I'll just get to the linear programming method in the end, and we'll talk about it in much more detail tomorrow. But uh, right now, I want to uh, give a general overview of positive definite kernels. Uh, of course, it's a very wide subject, uh, so I will not tell you everything about them, but I will tell you some things which are hopefully interesting. Also, my point of view will be uh, maybe slightly unorthodox. Uh, I will not start with uh, Gegenbauer expansions, uh, as many books do. I will just start with a very general definition uh, of uh, uh, positive definite kernels uh, on arbitrary spaces and see, uh, try to explore their relation to energy minimization in general and uh, different connections to various problems and various properties that are encoded in positive definiteness. So, so uh, positive definiteness plays a very important role in energy minimization. And here uh, we will not just talk about discrete energies of this type that we discussed in the previous lectures. So I will talk even more about energy integrals here. So here let's, for simplicity, for the purpose of this lecture, we will assume that omega is compact. And uh, the kernel K is continuous. So in this lecture, I will not treat the singular case um, to make this, this will make things somewhat easier and more connected. And also, of course, we're assuming that K is symmetric. So K of X, Y is the same as K of Y, X. Okay. But other than that, we're not, we don't have any assumptions. Sometimes you could probably even, uh, you could for certain purposes, uh, relax the assumptions on K. You could say that it's slower, semi-continuous, but for now, let's just deal with continuous kernels. Okay. And then if the kernel is continuous, as so it's nice and bounded, then for any regular Borel probability measure on omega, this expression is well defined. And so you can so you can consider the energy integral with respect to a probability measure. So um, it is closely related to the discrete energy. And notice I did not do this in previous talks, but now I'm normalizing the discrete energy by one over n squared, because then this definition is compatible with the definition of the energy integral in the sense that this is just the energy integral applied to this empirical measure. Right? So that's exactly the same thing. All right. So, and the questions uh, in both cases are questions of minimization. You want to try to minimize this quantity. You want to try to understand which, in this case, which measures, which probability measures minimize this. In this case, which point configurations minimize this. Um, and naturally, the questions are uh, very much related to each other. And in general, of course, this question is more delicate because you have a, well, it's still a question about minimization over measures, but over a much more restrictive class of measures. But they are related in the following sense. I will not write exact statements. Basically, as n goes to infinity, the minimal energy, minimal discrete energies converge to the minimal energy overall. And uh, moreover, the cluster points of such measures that minimize this discrete energy converge weak star to uh, to the minimizing measure here. Um, but also, so essentially, if you understand what the minimizing measure is for the energy integral, you would uh, you would be able to understand at least in the large case of large n and the regime of large n what these measures, what these configurations have to look like. And uh, 
also if you know all the minimizers in the unlikely scenario that you know all the minimizers for a discrete measure you can deduce what the minimizer is for the energy integral um with this in mind many of the uh, problems from the previous lectures could also be just as well restated for um uh for continuous energies for energy integrals so you could ask um for example for this energy for the sum of distances you would replace it with a double integral okay so you would have something like this instead the integral over the sphere of x minus y d mu of x d mu of y and you would want to ask what measure minimizes this or maximizes in this case what what measure maximizes this and the answer to this is known and we will even see this later on that the it's uh sigma okay so the sigma when i say sigma i mean the uniform measure on the sphere okay whenever i say sigma in this lecture and the two next lectures it will be the uniform measure so so this is maximized uniquely maximized by the uniform measure sigma which tells you then that at least in some sense uh discrete minimizers as n goes to infinity have to be uniformly distributed they have to converge to sigma weak star in the weak star sense and you could also for example look at this energy where we replace the euclidean distance where with the geodesic distance and you can ask the same question you could replace it by the integral and ask which measures minimize them maximize it sorry which measures maximize it and uh, here as we shall see the answer and you could guess it from the um from the answer that's known here um well for even ends any centrally symmetric configuration is a maximizer so you can guess that it's probably not just sigma okay so in particular the answer here is any centrally symmetric Borel probability measure is a is a maximizer of this of the corresponding continuous energy energy integral the this energy integral um and we will also see see a proof of this fact later okay. um also okay let's go to the other example that we've considered so we consider this phase thought problem about the, the maximum uh, about the maximizing the sum of acute angles the sum of angles between lines and the conjecture was that it's the period for given n it's a periodically repeated orthonormal basis so you'd say take e1 e2 e3 e1 e2 e3 and continue like this so let me take my mask off would be better third yeah you can continue like this uh and um well at least in the case when the number of points is the multiple of the dimension you see that as a measure you just get the uniform measure on an orthonormal basis right you get uh you get uh, each point of the orthonormal basis with weight one over d and uh, that gives a continuous version of this conjecture which is still unsolved that if you consider this energy integral for with this kernel and if you minim oops if you minimize this then the minimizing measure is the uniform measure on the okay in this notation the ambient dimension is d plus one so it's so and if you actually here if you can prove the uh and the discrete version you would have proved the continuous version because by, you would you would have it by weak star density using num numbers of points which are multiples of dimension and in the opposite direction if you can prove the continuous version you would know at least the discrete version when n is the multiple of the dimension so yeah and lots of other problems such as for example the uh frame energy also makes sense as uh problems for energy integrals about measures rather than specific point configurations yes the question 
So can you go the other way, like using weak star convergence? Can you say something about large n? If you uh, so, can you say something about large n if you know if you know the answer to the continuum yes. problem? Right. Um, well, you need more. You cannot. Uh, you can say that you can have an asymptotic result. You can just say that if n go if n goes to infinity, you have weak star convergence, but it wouldn't give you. Just by itself, it doesn't give you any uh, quantitative estimates, uh, any quantitative relation. It just says that as n goes to infinity, you have you have conversions. But there are also ways to prove uh, results, and this we'll see that in the last lecture. You can compare um, the discrete energy and the continuous energy, the optimal continuous energy. You can. The, there are various formulas uh, which uh, which you can write down, which allow you to write down what this difference is. Okay, okay. So let's go back to the to the definitions. Uh, okay, so we will need a couple more quantities. So relate. So this energy here, this is a quadratic form with respect to mu. So we will also consider the corresponding bilinear form with two different measures. And it's exactly what you expect it to be. And another important uh, quantity that we will consider is the um, potential of the kernel K with respect to a measure mu. So this is what the function that you obtain when you integrate on the ones. We shall see in the next uh, this this quantity plays a very important role in potential here, in particular in energy minimization. So, which uh, if you try to minimize energy, which properties of this energy functional or of the kernel K or of the other associated uh, quantities, which properties are important? And uh, well, properties that come up uh, well. One of the most important is the positive definiteness of K, and I will talk about this more for most of this lecture. And others are convexity of the energy functional, of course, uh, and uh, the spectral theory of the associated integration of operator, the Hilbert-Schmidt operator uh, associated to the kernel K. Okay, and of course, potential theory plays an important role, so the so-called Euler-Lagrange equations. Um, so this is a very common fact from potential theory, which I will state now, and we will need it in the future. If you have a minimizer, or at least a local minimizer in whatever, let me not be very specific, in whatever natural sense you uh, want to give it. Uh, so if mu is a minimizer of the energy functional, then the potential is constant on the support of mu, and it can only be, and that constant is equal to the optimal energy or the minimal value of the energy or local, local minimum. And it can only be bigger off of the support. This is very standard. I will not prove this fact, but the first fact in any potential theory um, book related to such energies. Okay. So we will uh, we will keep this in mind. So this is an important. So the potential is constant at least on the support of mu when mu is a minimizer. All right. So now I introduce uh, the the positive the positive definiteness of kernels, uh, which will will play a very important role. So the definition is very simple. If you take the discrete standard definition, goes like this. If you take any um, set of points, any finite set of points in your domain, omega, and you consider the matrix, so essentially K applying element, element wise to, well, you can think of the, about this as the gram matrix. So if you were on the sphere and you had the inner product here, this would be the K applied to the gram matrix. This matrix is positive semi-definite. So if this property holds, then the function is positive, the kernel is positive definite. Uh, in particular, one very simple example of such a kernel is uh, if um, okay if if you take uh, if your kernel is on the sphere, well, if the domain, domain omega is the sphere and the kernel is just the dot product of x and y, okay, then the matrix that you get here is exactly the gram matrix, and gram matrices are positive semi-definite, so um, 
So that's a positive definite kernel, right? Well, positive semi-definiteness means precisely this. This is what's written here, and I'm doing everything in the real space for simplicity. Okay, so, um, and if you look at this equation, then you can easily rewrite it equivalently. You can say that, well, it's, this here is exactly the energy integral applied to the measure um, mu equal to ci delta zi. The discrete measure is weight ci. That's okay. now such discrete measures are weak star dense in the in the space of measures. So so you can just pass to the limit and say that this definition is just equivalent to saying that this uh, energy functional is non-negative for every measure mu for every Borel measure mu. All right. So so you already see the relation to to energies, uh, to energy integrals in the right there in the definition of positive definiteness. Okay, we will need a couple modifications of this property, especially since we're talking about energy minimization. Um, first of all, we'll say that K is positive definite up to a constant, up to an additive constant. Well, if there is a constant such that when you add it, the function becomes positive definite. Obviously, this will play an important role for energy minimization because if you are in a compact space, you add the constant to your kernel, energy minimizers do not change. You have the same energy minimizers. So, um, so ed additive constants will not play a role. That's why we need this relaxation of the definition. Okay. And there is another important relaxation of this definition uh, that's um, uh, conditional positive definiteness. Okay. So conditional positive definiteness, the simplest way to state it is the following, that this inequality that we had in the definition of positive definite functions holds not for all measures, but for all measures of total mass zero. Okay. So all measures that have total mass zero. Um, this uh, this will be quite important uh, in, in energy minimization problems. Uh, so it's a slightly weaker uh, weaker property. Uh, notice that positive definiteness up to a constant implies conditional positive definiteness quite easily because if uh, if you have a measure of mass zero then you can add constants for free, okay? Because constants do not change the value of the integral. Okay, and then if the function is positive definite up to a constant for some constant C, this has to be non-negative. Right? So it's not true in, uh, opposite in the opposite direction. You can construct examples which show that uh, conditional positive definiteness uh, does not imply positive definiteness up to a constant, although in many natural cases it will be true, in particular in a sphere, and we'll see a pretty general statement uh, when, when this equivalence is true. All right, so now a couple more general facts about uh, positive definite kernels. So as I mentioned, uh, the spectral uh, properties and general properties of uh, the associated Hilbert Schmidt operator. So, so this is the here is the Hilbert Schmidt operator associated to the kernel A. You just integrate uh, with respect to the measure mu. It's the kernel given by K. So obviously, this uh, if K if every K is continuous, this is you get a compact operator. And it's pretty easy to prove very standard, simple exercise that if K is positive definite, that's equivalent to the fact that the Hilbert Schmidt operator is, is a positive operator. Okay. There is a little uh, glitch here is that you have to, you can only say that K is positive definite on the support of your measure mu. Here we're integrating with respect to the measure mu. Well, this operator doesn't see anything that happens off of the support, right? So, 
So that's we will have to take this into account at some point. Okay, but uh, generally you have this equivalence. Well, and also it's easy to see that this is a compact operator. So, so you have, uh, if you take it, you have a sequence of eigenfunctions, which are continuous. And you can write your kernel in this way then, and all your eigenvalues are non-negative. If k is positive definite, this is positive operator, so all the eigenvalues are non-negative. And interestingly, um, well, if you just view this identity in the L2 sense, it's obvious, right? It's just the spectral expansion. But much more can be said here. Actually, the convergence here is, uh, this converges absolutely and uniformly. And that is a consequence of uh, Mercer's theorem from, uh, from spectral theory. If the kernel is positive definite, okay, here is positive definite, then the convergence in this expansion is automatically absolute, which is very nice, which means you can do pretty much whatever you want with this expression. A question? Okay. Uh, don't you need that the integral of kxx has to be finite for this to hold? Uh, the, well, but I am dealing with continuous functions. Yes. Yeah, and right. You, you are you are absolutely right. But I'm dealing with continuous functions, and I precisely that's because I wanted to avoid <laughs> questions like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Of course, in general, you need you need some conditions. But... All right, and. Uh, Another uh, thing that will be important. So if you have, uh, so this relates finally to minimizers of the energy. If you have a, an energy minimizer, uh, which uh, with the additional condition that uh, I k of, uh, of mu, the energy itself is non-negative, okay. then uh, the Hilbert Schmidt operator with respect to this measure mu, the, the, the minimizing measure, is a positive operator. So you can prove it. I will not write the proof. Uh, so writing the proofs of all these facts would, would have taken a lot of time. But uh, basically, the idea is the following that if mu is a minimizer, then the function one, constant function, is an eigenfunction on the uh, well, uh, is an eigenfunction of t. Okay, the, the indicator of the support of mu is an eigen. Why is that? That's because of the Euler-Lagrange equations. The Euler-Lagrange equations say that if you integrate your kernel once, so, so f disappears because it's one. If you integrate your kernel once, you get a constant. Right. So, so you so constant gives you a constant. It's an eigenfunction. Okay, and then uh, if uh, you can just argue by contradiction. If you assume that t is not positive, find an eigen eigen function corresponding to a negative eigenvalue, and you can see that then you can get a smaller value of the energy. That's very standard approach, as, would, as you would imagine. This is done. Okay. All right. But what this means, what this tells us right away, is that if mu is a minimizer, so I I can drop this condition. And I can say that if mu is a minimizer, then, okay, well, let's go back. This fact here is equivalent to K being positive definite on the support of mu, right? So this tells us that the mini, uh, if mu is a minimizer, then K is positive definite up to constant. on the support of mu. And also, as we discussed before, it implies that it's conditionally positive definite on the support of mu. So right away, you know that if you have a minimizing measure, uh, your kernel has to be positive definite on, on the support of that measure. In 
various situations it gives you a way to prove that something is not a minimizing measure. If you can show that the kernel is not positive definite in the support, uh, it's uh, then uh, then you know that that measure is uh, cannot be a minimizer, and or actually any measure supported on that set could not be a minimizing. All right. Um, okay, let's move on. So we will look at a very special class of measures, measures that we expect could be um, could be mini minimizers. And the def this definition on one hand is suggested by the um, Euler-Lagrange equations. Okay, so we'll look at measures and we'll call them k-invariant. Uh, the the property is uh, the following: that if you integrate, if you take the potential of k with respect to this measure, okay, you get a constant on the whole domain. Okay. So, um, Euler-Lagrange equations tell tell you that these are natural candidates for minimization. Uh, okay, you. Uh, Actually, if a measure is a minimizer and if it has full support, then you know right away that it's k-invariant. Okay. Um, let me skip a couple slides for now and I'll return to them. And then, uh, and let's look at some examples. What, which measures, for which measures do you know that they uh, are, um, that they're invariant? Okay, so, well, first of all, as I already said, Minimizers or even local minimizers with full support are going to be invariant due to a little branch equations. Okay. Well, if you if your domain is the sphere and you take a rotational invariant kernel, then of course if you integrate once, it's it's independent of the other points and uh, you you get a constant. So that's a um, that's an invariant measure. And actually, this is true. Uh, in in more generality, you could take two-point homogeneous spaces, uh, uh, the, like the projective space, the Hamming cube, uh, whatever you like, uh, or um, and lots of other examples. Uh, when your kernel is um, invariant with respect to isometries of the underlying space. Okay. Well, um, in here again, this is an example where the invariant measure has full support. Okay, there are examples where invariant measures do not have full support. For example, we could still be on the sphere. Um, and if our kernel is a polynomial, and uh, if uh, Z is a spherical design, so, so this polynomial of degree, say, N. Z is a N design. So this is a discrete set, such that the average of the set gives you the same uh, value as the average uh, over the whole sphere for all polynomials of degree N. Okay, well, you can show that then the empirical measure on this set is invariant. Um, other examples, um, for example, if your domain is the unit interval and your kernel is, is the, well, the distance between points, okay, then if you take one half of the mass at one endpoint and one half at the other endpoint, this will be an invariant measure. That. Um, more generally, it's, you can view this as a generalization of this fact. If you view, if you take the sphere again, and your kernel is um, the geodesic distance, uh, then, for example, if you take mu. have weight one half at two opposite poles, then this is an invariant measure. And actually any symmetric measure will be invariant in this case. So it's also easy to check. So, so you see that there are actually lots of, also lots of examples of measures which do not have full, which are invariant, but do not have full support. Okay. All right. 
Um, I'll go back to one. It's a little, I'll make a little bit of a detour. Uh, I think it's an interesting topic from metric geometry, which is not very well known. So I'll tell you a little bit about the origin of the term. So at least uh, this is where I saw this term. So there is a very interesting theorem due to Gross, which goes back to 1964. It, um, so it's now came to be known as rendezvous numbers. So it's interesting that somehow in these topics, you have all these innuendos. You have the kissing numbers, the rendezvous numbers. Um, so the rendezvous number is, uh, is the following. So assume you have some compact metric space. So it has to be compact. The metric K. Okay, then uh, the following is true for any number finite number of points in the space okay well sorry first there exists a number d and this is called the rendezvous number so this is the rendezvous number such that for any finite set of points in your space you can always find a new point so that the average of distances is equal to the this prescribed fixed value d that depends just on this metric space so just on omega and k so it's pretty it's a pretty interesting statement um okay um the the name comes from the fact that if you have n people and you want to you want to arrange a meeting with uh, with all of them you can always find the point for them to meet so that the average distance that they have to travel is fixed um yeah a question okay sorry um yes uh, so um well it's also quite it's related to uh energy integrals you can do the same thing as we did before you can so this is for discrete measures you can now do it for arbitrary measures so you can rewrite that for any measure mu or any probability measure barrel probability measure there exists a point x in omega such that the potential the integral of k x y the mu of uh, the mu of y is equal to d, and this here is precisely the potential right, of a with respect to mu at x. And so, and yeah, the passage from here to here is the same. You just this is this is the same thing, just written for a discrete measure. All right. Um, well, uh, and in this uh, topic, there are a number of papers written on rendezvous numbers. In this topic, invariant measures play an important role because if you know that you have an invariant measure, then you can find this value d right away because this value then would be independent of the point x, okay? And you can use that measure to find to find this value d. Um, so rendezvous numbers, actually the fact that this symmetric space is not that important. All you need here is a continuous symmetric function. It works the same way. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting object and uh, rendezvous numbers are found for many simple metric spaces. On the other hand, there are lots of other simple metric spaces for which rendezvous numbers are still not known. He has a question. Yeah, so how do we know that uh... At least one number exists. I, I will actually give you a proof. I decided, yes, this, this is a very, not a very well known topic, so I, I will prove this here. So, once again, the theorem is a given metric space, uh, there's always exists a fixed number d called the rendezvous number, so that, well, I'll give it in this form. Okay. For any, for any measure, you can find the point x so that the potential is equal to that fixed number. But the name rendezvous, once again, comes from here from the discrete version of that statement. So you can always find a meeting point with the same average distance. Okay, so let, let's prove this theorem. So I'll prove something in detail. Well, at least the sketch of the proof, okay. All right, so, so this is the short version of the statement here. And so I claim that 
this number is equal to this min max of the mixed energies. And we will prove it, uh, well, so let's fix the measure mu for a moment. And let's uh, look at the values of the potential at, at various points x. Well, that's, uh, it's a continuous function, so the range of values is some interval, okay? So what we want to say is that if we take the intersection of these intervals over all measures, then there is a point, there is a point intersection, there is a single point. Actually, that point is unique. So there, this, this is also, there exists a unique uh, D. All right. So, okay. Well, let's look at this quantities uh, first, the minimum of, of the mixed energy for a fixed measure mu. Well, it's equal to the minimum of these expressions. Well, if you just take nu to be a delta function, just because delta functions are extreme points of the set of probability measures. So, and that is exactly the minimal value of the potential because this exactly gives you the potential at the point X. So, and that, so in our notation, this is exactly A of mu. On the other hand, if you can do the same thing for the maximum, okay, the same argument, okay. And then, well, essentially all we need to do is use an appropriate version of the min max theorem. Yeah. See that the minimum, the maximum of the minimum is the same as the minimum of the maximum. And moreover, this would show that this number then is unique. All right, uh, so, so this is a sketch of the proof. And, uh, and th this was a detour, but yeah, I, I sort of like this topic, so I decided to throw it in. Okay, so let's, uh, okay, let's continue talking about uh, energy integrals for, um, for positive definite kernels, but now for, for a while, I will uh, work in the case where I have a measure mu, which is K invariant. So once again, let me remind you the definition. The definition was that if you take the um, integral once, if you take the potential, this is constant on omega. Okay. All right. Uh, so there is a nice identity which, uh, which happens when the measure is invariant. Okay. Then the identity is this. So an interesting thing about this identity is that while the energy integral is a quadratic functional of measures, Somehow it shows that around this invariant measure, this behaves linearly. And the proof of the identity is very simple. So if you take, well, let's work from right to left. This is a quadratic functional, so you just get. But uh, now let's, uh, let's take a look at the middle term. And the middle term is just so you're integrating first with respect to mu and then with respect to nu. But by definition, this is constant. Right? And that constant has to be the same as the energy. So you, you just get the energy with respect to mu. Okay? And it's a constant. So the integration in nu doesn't matter anymore. Okay, that's good. So, 
So then you end up having ik of nu minus ik of nu. So this is a very simple identity which has lots of important implications. So, so the identity is absolutely trivial, but it's very nice. For example, if you will look at this identity, this tells you right away that um, if the kernel k is conditionally positive definite, then it is equivalent to the fact that uh, mu is the minimizer of the energy over all signed measures of mass one. Notice that here I didn't say that it's a probability measure, it's just a measure of mass one. So I needed that it has mass one here when I integrated the constant, but I didn't need that it's a positive measure. So it, it goes both ways very easily. Um, that's, uh, well, if k is positive definite, this is not negative, so mu, mu minimizes. And and vice versa. Okay, if if uh, if mu minimizes over all uh, over all signed measures, then for any sign, so then this is not negative, and you can represent any um, any signed measure of mass zero this way, well, up to a multiplicative constant. Okay. So it doesn't imply right away by itself that mu minimizes over all, um, that if mu minimizes over all probability measures, uh, that then k is conditionally positive definite. But it will be true in, in general, but this identity alone does, doesn't give you that. Right. Another interesting thing that also follows from this identity is um, okay, uh, a a local to global principle, which we already saw a different uh, manifestation of the local to global principle for the frame energy. This is this is a diff different type of lo local to global principle, but uh, it also holds here. So assume that mu is a local minimizer in more or less in, well, not in any sense. Wasserstein d infinity wouldn't work, but they in the total variation norm or in the Wasserstein P norm or the, the most restrictive. So I will use the directional. I assume it's a minimizer in every direction. It's a local minimizer in every direction. Okay. Uh, then it's actually a global minimizer of this energy. So you cannot have local minimizer which are not global. And the proof is very simple. So it just takes two lines. I'm using this identity twice. Okay. So I know that if I take this difference for t small enough, this has to be non-negative if it's local minimizer. Okay. So, well, I use this identity. So the difference between these two measures will give me precisely this. It's a quadratic function, I'll pull out t squared, and I use this identity again. So it tells me that this thing has to be non-negative for any measure new. Which which tells me that it's a global minimizer, so, so it's it's an interesting another interesting connection. Um, more generally, so this there is a interesting fact that lots of different things turn out to be equivalent. Okay, so this is uh, so this theorem in this form is due to myself and uh, Ryan Matske and Sasha Vlasuk. Although, yeah, I don't want to claim any owner, a lot of ownership here. A lot of these facts are classical. And uh, while well, some implications I believe are new, but I think it's never been tied together in so many equivalent conditions, uh, that at least I haven't found it anywhere. So if you take a continuous kernel on omega, continuous symmetric kernel, and assume that there exists a probability measure which is k invariant and has full support. So here we need these two conditions. It's k invariant and has full support. Then all of these properties, this huge list of properties are equivalent. And some of the implications work without any additional assumptions about the measure mu. Most of the implications, uh, most of the other implications uh, work only on the, under the assumption that mu is k invariant, and there are only a couple implications that need full support. Well, in particular, for example, um, 
well, the this equivalence, which we've this, this talked about a little bit, if you don't have full support, you will only have this expansion on the support. Um, so I just want to go over some of these conditions and uh, tell uh, tell you a few words. So by the way, here I have a diagram of the of different implications. So the solid lines are implications that work no matter what. Uh, squiggly lines need uh, need an invariant measure, and these coupled dashed lines are the lines where you need full support in the full support condition. Um, well, notice that a lot of things become equivalent in this setting. So first of all, positive definiteness and conditional positive definiteness are equivalent under this condition. We, we saw that there is an implication in one, simple implication in one direction, but actually here these, these two notions are equivalent. A lot of local and global properties become equivalent. In particular, local minimize, being a local minimizer is equivalent to being a global minimizer, which also tells you that local minimizers in all in many various senses are equivalent. So local mini, directional local minimizers, Wasserstein P distance for uh, P greater than one, less than infinity, um, total variation. Um, for example, convexity, well, first of all, convexity is equivalent to these two versions of positive definite. Uh, positive definite is con convexity of the um, functional, uh, of the energy functional, both on the space of probability measures and on the space of all measures of uh, size one, even signed measures. Uh, minimization over probability measures and signed measures of size one is also equivalent, which is also interesting because in general, you don't even know whether a minimizer over uh, these measures exists because it's not a compact space. Um, convexity on the whole space is equivalent to convexity just around mu uh, and, and so on. So, so there are lots of these properties which, uh, which uh, turn out to be equivalent. So uh, in particular, all of this applies to the sphere. And today I'm running out of time. I'll finish in a couple of minutes, but next time we'll we'll talk about uh, positive definiteness on the sphere. So all of these properties apply. Um, and we see that it's a consequence of general theorem that you, you don't need Gegenbauer polynomials, for example, or spherical harmonics to deduce all these properties. So they, they follow from general theory. And um, and we will we will discuss the specific case of the, of the sphere next time, and this will bring us back to spherical codes and optimal packings and some other problems on the sphere through the so-called linear programming method, in which positive definiteness plays a very important part. Okay, and I think I will stop here. I think this this is good. Thank you. Stop. Thank you very much.